Okay, assalamu alaikum, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excited to get started again, another Tuesday fabulous session, inshallah. Man, after the session on Saturday, I think we were like completely blown away. I think we've mostly recovered, but um, it was incredible and amazing. Um, and um, I just, I wanted to update the count. So we had said last time it was, we um, hit a milestone of our 40th surah. So I went back, um, we did 16 before Project Illumin, although one of them was Rahman, which we've done twice. And then we did 12 um, prior to Suli. So our total count now is 68 suras that we've covered, which is incredible if you think about it. Um, so anyway, um, it's hard to wrap your brain around that number. I mean, that's, that's like what, like over, yeah, over, over half. It's amazing. So anyway, uh, lots of exciting things happening here. I thought I would share, you know, one of my favorite things is sharing some of the really sweet messages that we get. Just, um, you know, it's it's a really nice emotional, spiritual pick me up. And um, thank you for people. And I, and I have to apologize in advance. I, I'm, I try to keep these very anonymous. So um, and I, I don't always take people's permission. In fact, I mostly don't take people's permission. I just kind of share it because it's so beautiful. And I think these things are, are really important um, to share. So first, um, uh, someone said, Salaamu Alaikum. I must first say, I love the work of the Suli Institute, and as a theologian myself, I am truly indebted to Dr. Abul Fadl's life work. Um, and then this person is making a, a donation and offered to um, donate to improve our recording equipment so that the quality of our um, work can be delivered. Um, so may God bless you, alhamdulillah. Um, then this one. Um, so, Salaamu Alaikum, Dear Grace, Jazakallah Khair for your beautiful words. I truly feel like what you and Dr. Fuddle do is absolutely priceless, and if I can be a small part of such a vision where the message of our Creator is made clear to humanity's ears, I am forever, forever grateful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the opportunity. This was a thank you note because this person donated, um, you know, to, I think, to support a surah. I'm not sure. I'm still trying to find out which surah, maybe. Um, so Dr. Fuddle's work comes at a time um, when we needed this reminder of the essence of Islam because the Muslim world has totally lost sight of this essence and thus suffers the consequences as we do today. I have come to connect and understand this message after losing my amazing father to COVID um, in March of last year. For some reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought me to this realization that our time on this plane of existence is limited but that limited time is a test from Allah to see whether I keep on the Surat al-Mustaqim and dare to please Allah in all of my dealings, given that my understanding of this vast wisdom is very limited. Seeing, hearing, feeling, and understanding the message of our Creator through the lens of Dr. Fuddle has brought a kind of thirst for more and more clarity that I cannot explain. I benefit from all that Dr. Fuddle puts out. I pray that Allah bless him and protect him to continue doing what he does. I am here to support this voice of truth through which I envision our world to be a, a better place where one human sees another human as an equal and helps him or her farther, um, further the good and forbid evil. So that is, you know, and these kinds of messages, honestly, um, I feel like as an individual, if you get one message like this in your lifetime, you're incredibly blessed. And we, we get more than that. And so, alhamdulillah, thank you um, to everyone who shares that. And then this last one um, is really, really sweet. Um, Ramin shared it with me. <laughs> and so um, it's someone who follows us on Instagram and shares a lot of our posts and says, I tell everybody about you, even all my non-Muslim friends, all are watching the videos. It's at a level that a friend of mine dreamt that I left my husband to come study with the professor. <laughs> to which I told Ramin, um, tell her she can bring her husband. She doesn't have to leave him. <laughs> so, <laughs> alhamdulillah, it was really, really beautiful. So, um, anyway, just um, thank you again. When people share messages like that, it's really encouraging and it helps make um, sometimes a very lonely path less lonely. Um, and I, you know, we were talking yesterday about how, unfortunately, the, the sheikh is going to have to teach starting in the fall. And, you know, it's, it's so painful because if we were in another faith tradition, 
you know, we wouldn't have to be in this position because the vast majority of followers and believers would financially get behind their scholars and they, so that their scholars wouldn't have to continue to make a paycheck but could just focus all of their time on what they were put on this earth to do. And that is, you know, obviously to increase, I mean, well, you know, to increase our understanding um, of, of God's book. And um, so, you know, to, to the degree, I mean, if you even just go back and listen to, you know, Surah Qalam and understand the, the centrality of supporting knowledge in our day and age, especially when things are so dark, and the importance that God places on supporting knowledge and supporting scholars. You know, I think it would be very easy to see that, you know, any support that you give your scholars, especially someone like Dr. Abul Fuddle, gives you a very special place in God's eyes. And, you know, for that alone, for people who recognize this, I hope that they will, you know, help if there's any way to um, free the Sheikh from, um, you know, the demands we all benefit because it's this is free knowledge that we put out there and it's for anyone who you know is searching and wants to find it um and you know that's inshallah sure our, our reward is with allah but it doesn't make that path any easier and i just i wish um you know muslims would support their scholars um more than other faith traditions so inshallah um, but anyway, um, thank you though for, for the kind words everyone and the support um, and inshallah looking forward to another incredible session. This is not a short surah, this is going to be another special surah. They're all, they're all special, but um, some are shorter than others. This one's like, feels like it's right in the middle. <laughs> not easy, not hard. Okay, although they're all hard. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وتمام إحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم شرح مصر والسدي أم بأحل نقطة من لسان يفقه قولي نو جس سي before we get to Surah Al-Zariyat, that I think that for um, especially the, 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 the contemporary Muslim experience, um, a lot of people don't, don't realize that although this knowledge is offered for free, it comes at a very high cost. Um, uh, but uh, to, to do to pursue knowledge right in the right way through a disciplined methodological fashion to continue uh, pursue sources and it is it is a very high cost um, and I think you can always measure the health of an ummah with um, the extent to which it invests in knowledge. The knowledge is the is the only investment that pays dividends uh, for future generations. And it is the investment that um, shows how sophisticated a people are and the extent to which they are um, committed to values rather than uh, immediate satisfaction. Um, And one of the most remarkable thing is that with, uh, with everything, with, with now a lifetime spent in studying the Quran and all the halakhas that I've offered and, and um, whatever Allah has in store, um, I'll be the first to attest that I feel that I, I've only scratched the surface. 
in in this day and age, the idea of uh, knowledge or scholarship as a hobby is a myth. And you either invest yourself in it the right way, in other words, with your entire being, with every fiber of your being, or you should not even attempt to um, take the mantle of a scholar because the responsibility is heavy. Um, we, we, were, we had a meeting uh, yesterday um, for the, uh, the Tafsir project. The, uh, um, and we, we, I mean, the, the investment is in, enormous. And, um, and um, yeah, the investment is enormous. And, I, and to, the, the, it's extremely ambitious to try to finish the Quran and come out with a publication uh, of that, of this tafsir, uh, at least within my lifetime, only Allah knows best. So, so I echo the appeal for support. Okay, Surah al -Dhariyat. Uh, there yet. There yet. Um, I wish that I I wasn't um, I wasn't offering the surah on on a Tuesday night um, because I I had to put some serious thought into how to cover that yet in a single Tuesday session. Um, but let's, uh, I'll do my best. So, that yet is very interesting because stylistically it seems to belong to the early Mecca period um, on so many, the, the grammar, the, the style, the um, meter of the uh, verses, the music of the verses themselves. But Zariyat is not an early Mecca surah. It is a late Mecca surah. And uh, it was revealed after an Isra. And as we know from um, our previous discussions, that the sword that came after the Isra and before the Hijra uh, tend to convey structural meanings. Um, maybe you can call them constitutional, in the sense structural, in the sense of building societies, um, but definitely they all tend to deal with basic values for the structuring and the building of what we call civilizational uh, societies or civilizational entities. And in likelihood the Zariyat was revealed after Al-Ahqaf, which we've discussed um, so it was also revealed after Zuhruf, which we've discussed. Um, now how but how and, and I say likelihood because there's there are. I mean, it, it's it's there yet. In particular, we're not quite sure 
whether indeed it was after the Ahqaf or before Ahqaf, because we're not sure whether if it, it, whether it was shortly after the Hijrah uh, or um, mean shortly meaning a, a month or two after the Hijrah or longer than that. But we do know for sure that it was after the Isra. Um, and so, of course, that, that raises some interesting questions as to why is that yet at that point? And especially that Surat al Dariyat has one of the most famous Quranic um, statements or declarations, uh, and one that has uh, uh, garnered the interest of so many theologians over the course of Islamic history. And that is uh, Aya number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That where Allah says, I've created humans and jinn, and even possibly I've only created humans and jinn, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And we'll talk about what يَعْبُدُونَ means too, but for now, as a placeholder, let's say, to worship me. And of course, but right after, in 51, it says this, but in 52, right away, Allah affirms what the Quran consistently says, that Allah benefits nothing from human beings, origin, that they add nothing to Allah and they take away nothing from Allah. So it raises a, a, a an interesting theological question. Um, what does creating humans and jinn illa li'abudun, to, to worship me? Um, we can fulfill the, the divine is beyond needs and beyond what humans origin can contribute or give so so it's a elementary and basic in theology that it is not because of a, a an incompleteness let's say that Allah is filling in the divine self um, but the statement tells us something about why we are on earth and what the point of our creation is. And if Allah created human beings and jinn to worship Allah, the Abudun, in the sense of the way the angels worship Allah, for instance, then why free will? And Allah also tells us that, in fact, the majority of human beings will not believe, and the majority of human beings will not worship. So Knowing that, if the point is ibadah in the most strict meaning of the sense, meaning worship, supplications, dhikr, and so on, um, that role, we know, is played by angels and indeed played by entire creation um, and
that if that is the point of creating human beings and jinn, well, human beings and jinn of all creation are the ones who have the ability to, in fact, defeat that purpose, to, to refuse to worship. So that occurring in Surah al dhariyat this, this statement, um, this rather challenging and fascinating statement that comes out, it says, this is why I've created you. Um, becomes very important. And it also raises the question of, well, why this message in Surah al dhariyat in particular at this juncture of Islamic history. It is, again, post-Isra, but at a time in which um, Muslims are, or the, the Muslims around the Prophet are uh, at a very difficult and challenging point in the course of the Islamic message. And their, their persecution, there's no indication that they knew at this point that um, Hijra to Medina is on the horizon, maybe the Hijra to Habasha, uh, which included some of the most persecuted. But it most definitely from the time, from the very moment of revelation, it not only engaged Muslims, but it also engaged non-Muslims. And we have reports as to the reactions of non-Muslims to the statement towards the end of Surah Al-Dhariyat that Allah only created human beings and jinn for ibadah. Okay, so we'll come back to this. We'll come back to the issue of of what does this mean and what does it mean, especially in light of what we know um, would come later in the Quran. The issue of presentation for Surat al-Dhariyat is a bit challenging because Dhariyat is one of these sources where the Sufi-esque approaches um, materially differ from the traditional approaches. And Zariyat excited the imagination of the Sufi tradition. And so it, ha it has, it occupies um, a lot. In, I mean, it plays a, a fairly big role in, in a lot of the Sufi discourses. Uh, as I hope, I mean, I'll try to give a sense of that. Um, as we go along, even in uh, the writings of someone like Ibn Qayyim, um, who wrote his commentary on Surah Zariyat is very long. And although Ibn Qayyim is, is normally cited um, and referred to by uh, the modern day Salafis. But if you read his, everything he said about Surah al Zariyat, you, you find this is one area where um, 
you get a, a clear sense of the impact of that surah in Islamic theology, even outside of the outside the Sufi esque uh, realm. Um, and for this surah, I am going to. I'm going to address both the traditional and the Sufi and and the way I understand the Surah simultaneously. And I hope that doesn't get too confusing. But we'll 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 see. Okay. So we notice that the surah starts out with a set of qasam. وَالذَّارِيَاتِ ذَرْوَى فَالْحَامِلَاتِ وِقْرَى فَالْجَارِيَاتِ يُسْرَى فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ أَمْرَى These four. فَالذَّارِيَاتِ ذَرْوَى Most say الذَّارِيَة is something that carries something else. Something that delivers something. And most said that what is what it is referring to is the wind delivering whatever it, 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 the sustenance for life. So the wind moving clouds in order to circulate rain or the wind carrying pollen that would also be there is there yet. Um, but the majority in at least the traditional tafasir saw is there yet the most natural and direct explanation for Zariyah, that which carries, uh, is a reference to winds that carry and distribute or scatter things around, locate. Um, Zariyah, although the study Quran says the scatterers as they scatter, the Zariyah the is usually implies implies an ordered scattering in other words a form of distribution not something chaotic some others within the traditional school of thought understood it that yet to refer to not winds, but interestingly enough, to women carrying babies. Um, because in, in, in old Arabic, you can say, um, النِّسَاءُ الزَّارِيَاتِ لِلْأَوْلَادِ Meaning women carrying kids. Um, or Imra'a dhariya means a, uh, a, um, a pregnant woman. Um, so both in the sense of wind or women uh, would be supported by old pre-Islamic Arabic. Um, Some said al-nisa'ul wal walud meaning women who are particularly fertile, but, you know, anyway. Uh, so that's, but what we can, what, the broader meaning is that which carries and dis distributes. Okay. Walhamilati wikra. And again here, you have al hamilati wikr al wikr is anything that constitutes 
a a weight, a responsibility, a burden, um, a, a mass. So that which carries a burden, a mass, a weight, and of course that then begs the question of, well, what is it referring to? And how is it that yet different than Hamilat? And many commentators said, well, they're not different. Both are references to winds and different functions of winds. Similarly, there are those who said both are references to women, but different functions or different nuances of the process of women bearing children and delivering children. And that's a minority view. Um, and the majority view is that it's a reference to the, the function of winds. Okay. فَالْجَارِيَاتِ يُسْرَى فَالْجَارِيَاتِ يُسْرَى Those that um, the study Quran says those that course with ease that's reasonable. Um, those that proceed move along with ease with without great difficulty and most commentators said and again make a, a long explanation w w without getting into, into all the, the different whys and all the p different arguments about the evidence most said more that this refers to ships as ships plow through the sea. Um, and again, notice the dependence on sh of ships on wind, and so the, 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 the all directly or indirectly a reference to the miracle and the role of wind in sustaining and, and maintaining human life. Others said, well, a minority view, or a, 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 not as widespread, said, well, um, there's no reason to limit it to ships um, sailing on, on water, um, but in fact, it is everything that explains movement that we don't quite understand in creation. And what I mean by not quite understand is um, the movement of the sun or the movement of the moon. Um, and again, these commentaries were written, remember, centuries ago. So, you know, saying, well, you know, what makes the moon move the way that it moves? Well, it can't be wind, um, but it does. Uh, what makes the earth move in the way that it, the earth moves? Uh, what makes the movement, uh, planetary movements that we witness? And again, as I said, that's a minority view, but it all ref goes back to the same idea of God alerting us to the mysteries of movement as, if you will, as sort of coded secrets for the creator, for the maker of all of this. فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ amra. Now, مُقَسِّمَاتِ amra. 
those that distribute. Now, what distributes in nature? Well, we, we know, for instance, that bees, as they pollinate, they distribute. Wind, as it pollinates, it distributes. So, most traditional tefasir said, well, again, it's one of the functions of, it's a reference to one of the things that nature do, that nature distributes water, nature distributes pollen, nature moves soil. Um, there is constant movement around us that Allah is swearing by and that we as human beings, especially at their time, we don't quite understand, but if we study, they will all point us to the divine. Of course, if, if they would have um, um, if they had access to modern sciences, I think they would find how true that is. But anyway. Now, many scholars said Al-Muqassimati Amra is not just what wind or whatever is in nature that distributes things, but it is a reference to what is behind nature, i.e. to angels. And because in, in old, the medieval imagination, uh, the, it was very popular to believe that angels moved clouds along and that angels would play a role in bringing and making clouds come together to have thunder and, and, and lightning and things like that. But even if you, even if you didn't accept that, that medieval outlook about the role of angels in, in nature, uh, the belief that angels played a direct role in your risk in um, uh, in your fate, in terms of your everything that befalls you, uh, you know how much money you make, what health you have, what illness you have, who dies, who doesn't die. That so they saw this as um, as a an oath by not just nature but beyond nature as well. Okay. Now notice five. The Jawab Qasim Inna Ma Tuadun Al Waqa. What you are promised will happen. And what is it that you are promised that will happen in the traditional tafsir? It is the hereafter that Allah is telling you the same maker who made motion the secret of existence and made motion perform so many functions that you are not aware of. The motion of planets, the motion of Earth, the motion of the sun, the motion of the moon, the motion of the wind, the motion of water, it, all of that is critical for your life and you don't understand it, but if you understand it, you will also understand that then whatever your creator promises you, that your creator will in fact deliver on what your creator tells you. إِنَّمَا تُوَعَدُونَ لَصَادِقُ وَإِنَّ الدِّينَ لَوَاقِعًا This is... And judgment will come through. Okay.
So this takes us to six. And we pause here for a second because the way Sufi asked Hafasir approached this Qasam was quite different. And um, it was the, 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 the opening verses of Surah Al-Dhariyat are understood in allegorical and yet powerful ways. If I... Um, so, there are many samples that are possible, uh, but Dariyat uh, um, here are some of the, the uh, I'll, I'll just read it in Arabic first, it makes it easy. تشير إلى الرياح تحمل أنين المشتاقين المتعرضين لنفحات الألطاف إلى ساحات العزة ذا ريات ذروة was often understood as Uh, um, Ibn Ajiba says, Riyah al Waridat al Ilahiya al Lati Tarid ala Kulub, uh, Fatataru minha al Amrad wa Shukuk wa al Amha wa al Oham wa al Khawatir. So, and there, there's, so, one sample of the Sufi Astafasir, and I actually don't remember where, where that come, came from, but it basically says that. It is the um, the 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 movement of longing for the divine. Um, that longs for the. beautiful, magnanimous extensions of divinity that would soothe and comfort the longing. A more common understanding of Wadhariyati Dharwa from a Sufi S perspective is that it refers not to the longing to the divine, but to Al-Altaf al-Ilahiyya, to, in fact, the, the winds that carry the gifts of divinity to those who long for it. So, Ibn Ajiba, for instance, uh, uh, says, um, Rihal Waridat al Ilahiya Lati Tarid Ala Kulub Fatadar Mina Fatadar Minha al Amrad wa Shukuk wa Abham Wal Khawatil and Natati Min Hadat Kahar al Kahar Latu Sodim Shaya illa the Fat Falhami Lati Wikra Fal Anfus Mutahara and so on. Okay. Then for Falhami Lati Wikra and those that bear the burden uh, uh, which we've uh, in the study Quran which as we said in the traditional perspective what ever carries something of weight like winds carrying pollen or or um, uh, um, winds moving clouds or clouds carrying rain uh, 
in the Sufi-esque approach, so for the wikra, الأنفس المطهرة الحاملة للعلوم والحكم والمواهب وقرا حملا لا حد له so in Ibn Ajiba it says that والحاملات وقرا is the sciences or systems of knowledge that facilitates know the knowledge of divinity. A, a, a less common example from the Sufi as tradition um, looks at al Hamilati Wikra as Sahabu al Tafir Rububiya as the language was that it, it is not the knowledge that that allow gives you access to divinity, but it is the visitations of divinity that gives you access to itself. Um, I'm just gonna I'll, I'll go on and then I'll come back to to summarize. The approaches so they they're less confusing so then we get to Yusra, and we said Jariyat Yusra in the traditional approach is whatever courses with ease like ships on a sea for instance but in the Sufi as tradition فالجاريات يسرى فالأفكار الجارية في بحار الأحدية من الجبروت إلى الملكوت um, والحكمة it, it is to, to put it simply الجاريات يسرى it, it, it is the venues that allows you knowledge of the reality that in turn allows you access to the divinity that you need venues to understand alam al jabarut or what is also known as alam al mulk alam al jabarut or alam al mulk as the material world and this is where the vast majority of people their knowledge stops they they know whatever they know about the world the material world that surrounds them Alam Jabarut. But what about the knowledge that allows you to see beyond the material world into Alam al Malakut, the world of divinity? The, what, what is behind the veil of materiality? It is very much a reality, like material reality. But it is a reality that is not perceived unless you have the venues or the methods that allows you to see it. Um, Ajariyat Yusra in other Sufi traditions that I recall reading was referred to as um, it's it's similar I mean it's it's similar just expressed in different language we'll say that um, whatever allows you to sail in Bihar al the the knowledge of navigation on the seas of Tawheed, how to navigate the sea of divinity so that you can get beyond the limitations of the material life that you ex live in and experience. 
Um, so, notice in the traditional approach, whether we say wind here, uh, rain here, you know, angels here, in the traditional approach, they saying Allah is, is swearing by our material existence, the forces behind our material existence. It's like saying Allah is swearing by what makes this material existence work. What makes the wind blow? What makes things get pollinated? What makes soil be soil that can sustain planets? What makes um, sunlight available? What makes what the planetary movements possible. It, all the secrets of creation, and that's what Allah is swearing by. In the Sufi Astaf approach, it is Allah swearing by what is beyond the material existence. Allah is swearing by what is inside of you that makes you long to go beyond materiality to say there must be something more than this or you know I stare at the stars and I know that this is not just material uh, material things but there's meaning beyond, beyond the material and it is the all the venues and avenues that allows you to reach either you to reach or that world to reach out for you either way um, either reaching towards the world of divinity or the world of divinity reaching out to you in turn Okay, and in the traditional approach, Allah swears by the miracle of the material creation in order to say that what I promised you will happen, will happen. In the Sufi-esque approaches, the Qasam is understood somewhat differently inna dina la waqi' sorry inna ma tu'aduna la sadiq wa inna dina la waqi' they they don't object that this that this might be in Allah swearing by the hereafter but they say a deeper meaning of this is the way it's always phrased is that Allah is swearing by the promise of enlightenment. If you reach out to me, the promise of enlightenment is there. Okay. Let's move on. والسماء ذات الحبك إنكم لفي قول مختلف يؤفك عنه من أفك so, والسماء ذات الحبك this is seven والسماء ذات الحبك Hubuk can have two possible meanings, but they're, 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 they're interconnected. Hubuk is a, a word that means um, 
when you say, for instance, habak al habla, means that you've threaded a rope so tightly that it is firm, or uh, so it could mean something that is built intricately and tightly, meaning something that is perfected, something done really well. But it also means something that has many pathways that are perfected. So it could, so, and this is again within many traditional, uh, uh, Tafsir said there are the heavens as Samat is full of pathways, roads that are perfected, built to perfection, but that we don't understand and we don't have a clue about. Others thought the idea of pathways in the heavens and skies to be very odd. And so they said, no, it's just saying Allah who perfected the skies, the heavens, that Allah built the heavens tightly and and, and with perfection, as it says elsewhere in the Quran. I mean, of course it's fascinating because in modern science, the idea of uh, heavens full of pathways, well, th- that, you know, wormholes and black holes and, you know, mm-hmm. it's not at all strange to us. It's not at all alien. Um, but it's fascinating that the Quran centuries ago refers to the Sama as that kubuk, which would literally uh, be a perfect way of describing uh, a heavens full of um um, intricate roadmaps. Um, okay, so this is what you, you often get in the traditional approaches and the extent to which they say about Samat Zat al Hubuk. In the Sufi esque tradition, most of the Sufi tradition said. As Sama here doesn't refer to the heavens that surrounds us, but as typical of Sufi allegorical approaches, the whenever they have a Sama, the Sama refers to the heart. The the sky refers to the heart. So it says with Sama al Qalb that al Taraiq al Ilahiya that the, your, the, 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 your heart are full of pathways to the Lord. Um, it's just that we, as we go on in life and become more and more dependent on material, we neglect these pathways and we re- allow obstructions to build. And so the roads become closed and um, you can't trespass, you can't move through the roads anymore. Uh, and that's, what, by the way, a very common imagery in Sufism is that the, uh, the, I can't tell you the number of times that a, if someone goes to study with a Sufi sheikh and the Sufi sheikh will say, uh, so, okay, step one is that you have to clear up the blocks in the you have to uh, remove the, the blocks that obstruct the roads in your heart. Okay, so, so far so good. So then we get to إِنَّكُمْ لَفِي قَوْلٍ مُخْتَلِفٍ This is eight. Study Quran translates it as truly you are of different or differing claims. Uh, 
the tr traditional tefasir typically say that verse 8 is speaking to the Meccans and saying, you Meccans um, are, have said many contradictory things about the Prophet ﷺ. That you have made a whole bunch of contradictory claims. You've said that he's a magician, you've said that he's um, insane, you've said that he is being, he's copying what he knows from uh, some Christian guy or some Christian people, um, that it's like saying you can't get your story straight. And these contradictions that plague your claims about the prophets um, core to these contradictions is that is that they are based on lies and that you know that they're lies. Within the traditional approach, others said, uh, agreed that yes, this is it is talking about the various conflicting claims um, um, about the, the, the message of the prophet, about the prophet and his message. Um, but when it came to yu'faku anhu man ufik, this is nine. Because of the way because of the grammatical a grammatical issue, because of a, 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 a disagreement about the grammar of the sentence, they said it, it's not saying that it, these conflicting claims are because of lies. However, it is saying it, it, what it's saying is, is that these are conflicting claims and whoever turns away from these conflicting claims there are those there are those who will believe the conflicting claims and follow uh, follow suit you know in other words listen to them and be influenced by them and there are those who will turn away from them. And of course, though the implication is that those who turn away from them are the smart ones. Now, in the Sufi esque tradition, the way that they understand that you have made different claims is related to the way they understand verse number seven that the Samat that the Hukbuk is a reference to the um, heavens of uh, to to the heart and the pathways in the heart to the Lord and the way that they read verse eight or the way that they understand verse 8 is that it's saying there are so many of you or most of you who because you are oblivious to the pathways is within your heart to your Lord you live the best way to describe it as you live confused, conflicted and confused. You're up and down all the time. You ride different moods at different times. Some days you feel good about yourself. Some days you feel bad about yourself. Some days you think that 
your life makes perfect sense. Other times you feel that your life sucks and doesn't make sense at all. Some, day, some days you, find, you feel that you find your purpose in life. Other times you feel that you're lost and might as well be dead. إِنَّكُمْ فِي قَوْلٍ مُخْتَلِفٍ And truth eludes you. وَقُتِلَ الْخَرَّاسُونَ Because woe, to, to, to translate it, خُتْلَ الْخَرَّاسُونَ is number 10. Woe be to those who lie to themselves. Study Quran translates it as perish those who conjecture. No, Kharasun are those who deceive themselves, those who lie to themselves. So the tradition of Tafsir, Qutul al Kharasun, um, it's close. They say those who are not straightforward with themselves about. The, the, uh, about God. In other words, they don't bother with learning about God. They're lost. قتل الخراسون الذين هم في غمرة ساهون So 11 explains or elaborates upon the خراسون الذين هم في غمرة ساهون Those who are um have lost themselves oblivious to themselves or to the real issues that surround them. Fighamrat in Sahun literally means that you're oblivious because you're too preoccupied. That you're you're just too preoccupied, you're too busy, too self-involved to be conscious of either God's message or the pathways within your heart. Yes, Aluna Ayana Yawmuddin, they ask when is this last day? Yawmahum ala nari yuftanun. Well, and this is sort of uh, then the Quranic response it's the day where they will be exposed to punishment, to hellfire. ذُوقُوا فِتْنَتُكُمُ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ This is 14. Um, this is your trial here. It's like saying, you know, this is what you've wondered about all your life, or this is what you lived conflicted about all your life. Well, here it is. Um, this is what, and تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ here is, it's sort of, a, it carries a little bit of um of, of um, irony, if you will, because it's like saying, um, this is what you're not sure about, this is what you, you know, often thought, well, is it really going to happen? Well, here it is. Okay, and then 15, in the المتقين في جنات وعيون, 15, the, the, then it, it's as always in the Quran, whenever it talks about those who will be punished, it always talks about the other side. Until we get to 16. آخذين ما آتاهم ربهم إنهم كانوا قبل ذلك محسنين because they were virtuous, Muhsinin, they were virtuous and they deserved Allah's word. Okay. What you've noticed up to verse 16 is that I've talked about the traditional approach and I've talked about the Sufi-esque approach and I haven't said anything yet about um, the way that I understand these verses. Now, what 
there is a question raised, and I think it would be a fair question, and that is, when you look at the the oath, وَالذَّارِيَاتِ ذَرْوَى فَالْحَامِلَاتِ وِقْرَى فَالْجَارِيَاتِ يُسْرَى فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ أَمْرَى إِنَّمَا تُعَدُونَ لَصَادِقٌ Allah is swearing by what we can properly describe as functions. A dhariyat is something, whatever that thing is, that performs a function. Al hamilat is something that performs a function. A dhari the function that it performs is to move things. Al-Hamilat, the function that it performs is to carry things. fal it's again a function. And jariyat is something that runs something from one place to another. fal it's again a function. But this time the function is to distribute something. And whenever I find an oath in the Quran, because we know that when Allah swears by a star, Allah swears by a star, or Allah swears by the moon, Allah swears by the moon. In other words, when, when Allah wants to swear by, by something concrete, Allah does it. So it begs the question, in my mind, why is the oath here, why is it a function-oriented oath? And without telling us precisely what that thing is, I mean, it, it, it's, it doesn't say explicitly it's the wind, it doesn't say explicitly it's the clouds, it doesn't say explicitly it's angels, it doesn't say explicitly it's the pathways within the heart or, or Allah reaching. So I take the idea of the function. Um, seriously. Okay, so that's one. Two, I'm very mindful of the fact that this is a post-Isra surah and a pre-Hijra surah and that with these types of surah that come late in the Meccan period, it is prepping Muslims for something. The third factor is precisely what I began with. Verse 51, that so much of Surah Al-Dhariyat is in fact centered around that statement about the purpose for creation. I've created jinn and human beings li'abudun to, and, and we, we'll talk about the meaning of ibadah here, but so could it be that that in the same way that Surah Al-Dhariyat is telling us, Allah is telling us what Allah wants from human beings and jinn, that the functions that are laid out at the beginning of the Surah relate 
to the objective of the Surah? Well, for now, we know from the surah that will come shortly after Surah al that the idea of al istikhlaf fil ard it will be very critical that human beings are charged with being khulafa Allah fil ard being the caliphs of Allah on earth literally representing Allah and to represent Allah on earth you need to implement the values of godliness you're not going to represent Allah on earth by representing the value of godlessness you you're not going to if if ta'mir al-ard civilizing the earth is going to be done by taking the divine out and the values of divinity out, then that's not um, uh, then that's attempting to civilize the earth through kufr, through rejecting a role for the, the divine. So go back again to the, the these customs. Adhariyati Dharwa. What is what do the Dhariyat do? Well the Dhariyat distribute something, spread something. Right? A study Quran said scatter, but I like distribute. فَالْحَامِلَاتِ وِقْرَى That which carries. Like, like a pregnant woman. فَالْجَارِيَاتِ يُسْرَى That which moves something along. فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ أَمْرَى That which distributes. إِنَّمَا تُوَعَدُونَ لَصَادِقُ What you are promised is truthful. Again, I am thinking of Muslims at the time. I'm thinking of the historical role at the time. I am thinking of the entire message of the Qur'an. We said... Allah is swearing by functions, right? That I think no one can deny. That these the, these are oath by functions. So are there functions that Muslims situated in that historical period need to be very much aware of? Well, look again. فَالذَّارِيَاتِ ذَرْوَةِ A function of spreading. Spreading what? You want to say spreading the Islamic message? Sure. But spreading the idea. فَالْحَامِلَاتِ وِقْرَةِ Those who will carry. What is carrying, carrying a message about? What is carrying an idea? It's allowing an idea to develop and grow and flourish. فَجَارِيَاتِ يُسْرَى That will communicate an idea. فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ أَمْرَى that that will divide roles. So now, if you think of it, a 
Allah is telling them, what I promised you is truth. إِنَّمَا تُوْعَدُونَ لَصَادِقُ وَإِنَّ الدِّينَ لَوَاقِعُ What I promised you is the truth. And religion will prevail. But each of you has a function, a role. There are there's roles, the role of spreading the idea, developing the idea, communicating the idea. فالمقسماتي أمرا and and playing the role that you are assigned. If you understand the oath that way then it play, makes perfect sense that Surah Al-Dhariyat is revealed before the Hijrah. You are, a, a lot of these people are going to be told to migrate, but you know what? If all of them want to be leaders, it's not going to work. If each one of them sees himself or herself as the hero of heroes, it's not going to work. Each one of them must be willing to play the role that is given to them. That each will be, each has a purpose, a cause. In order for the Islamic message to take off, You are not all the same. There are those who will be spreading the idea. There are those who will be developing the idea. There are those who will be communicating. And those who will be assigning roles. And this is intimately connected into the way I understand I've created humans and jinn to worship me. Because, and we'll come back to this, but I'll just skip ahead for one second. Because, how do we truly worship Allah? Do we worship Allah by praying rak'ahs and doing fasting? What we know from what is revealed later on, especially in Surah Al-Baqarah, that we worship Allah in, 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 a, in a sense by creating the kingdom of divinity on earth. But the kingdom of divinity, I don't mean by having someone rule in Allah's name. That's not the... But by human beings building a civilization that embodies the values of divinity. Creating an ethical civilization as long as these ethics are anchored in divinity is ibadatullah. The ibadah, the, 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 the ibadat in terms as rituals, you know, whether Allah accepts them or not accepts them, that, that's a matter of intention. You know, someone could do salah and they, 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 they don't have the right intention. Other person can do salah, they have the right intention. It's not a matter of optics. It's not a matter, but to create a civilization or a source to to ta'mir to, al-ard, to, come together as human beings while as Surah Al-Dhariyat itself will tell us while implementing what we've learned from Surah Al-Zukhruf what we've learned from um, 
Surah al rad what we've learned from Surah Luqman. In other words, while implementing the morality that Allah was teaching Muslims in Mecca is Ibadatullah. But to do that, it, it, you need a level of maturity that those who will come up with the, with the, with the ideas might not live to see these ideas become prevalent or become spread or become dominant or whatever. You each has to play a role. There are the inventors of the idea. There are the incubators of the idea. There are the transmitters of the idea. There are the teachers of the ideas. There are the communicators, the propagandists of the idea. There are various functionalities. And if you persevere with this, God's promise is true. You're not going to achieve God's promise if, for instance, you try to do istikhlaf through coercion and misery. Because we've learned that coercion is against the ethics of Allah. So if you try saying, I'm building an Islamic state, and the first thing you do is you're coercing people to follow God's law. It's a no-go. It is not about the optics. It is not about forcing women to wear hijab or forcing people to go to Jum'ah. These are, these are because people can do all of that and they, they, they don't even believe in God. It is about the value systems. And we'll see, because it, it, it's, this is, I'll, I'll at least share with you the rest of Surah Al, I believe Surah Al Zariyat, in fact, affirms this and bolsters this and builds upon it. Okay. So, and here, when we get to وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْحُبُقِ إِنَّكُمْ فِي قَوْلٍ مُخْتَلِفٍ يُؤْفَكُ عَنْهُ مَنْ أُفِكْ قُتِلَ الْخَرَّاسُونَ My understanding of this is actually quite important because Allah is swearing by the heavens that have pathways built to perfection of levels of sophistication that we can't understand and we don't understand and unless we start traveling in warm holes and black holes we're never going to understand but innakum fi qawlin mukhtalif you it is like saying you disagree upon so many things. You have an enormous amount of diversity. The, Allah knows this about us because Allah knows that we are also that we are very argumentative beings. And Allah who has built the, this, the heavens with amazing sophistication of the heavens Knowing our nature is, is, is peanuts, is nothing. But this diversity, this enormous differences between us, the way I understand this is 
it misleads those who want to be or allow themselves to be misled by it. It's like saying there are, there are people who see all the diversity and all the differences and say, well, no one knows what the truth is. There is no God. Or, well, how do we, well, you know, it's just a matter of point of view. We can't really believe in godly values because there's just diversity of values. يُؤْفَكُ عَنْهُ مَنْ أُفِكُ And if, if you know Arabic, reread it. You'll see it so plain that it exactly says that. In fact, you'll wonder how anyone could have understood it differently. يُؤْفَكُ عَنْهُ مَنْ أُفِكُ those who are misled by it are misled by it. But Qutil al Kharrasun. Now, woe, the one that are poison, are toxic, are Kharrasun, the liars, the cheaters, the frauds. Those don't believe in anything. Maybe they be, maybe other just self interest, but they're oblivious, and they know ultimate ultimately don't believe there are consequences or judgment. It's all a matter of opportunism, and that is precisely why. They deserve what they get. Because not only do they mislead themselves, but they mislead others by being the slime that they are. Okay. Now, when it comes and it juxtaposes those who or the, the saved group. كانوا قليلا من الليل ما يهجعون وبالأسحار هم يستغفرون. Seventeen. A little of the night that they slumber. Now this, by itself, it keeps you awake at night because. When it comes and talk, now remember, it, it, what it, at this point it's addressing Muslims who have remained Muslim after the Isra. And it's saying, it's, it's as if saying they, or in retrospect we can understand it, saying that they are, have, have earned the right to build what they're going to build. Because in fact, قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهَجَعُونَ they, 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 they spend nights in worship. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ 18 And they are, you know, they're, they're sitting there doing istighfar, praying for forgiveness at dawn, or at the break of dawn, Of course, Muslim theologians, um, traditional tafsir, where it seemed to be um, realized how how um, wearisome this is. So you find some odd hadith that says um, that well, qalilan min al uh, means that they used to worship from Maghrib to Aisha. Well, from Maghrib to Aisha is not, they, they slept very little, you know. Uh, others, uh, which have always chuckled at, uh, there is a hadith attributed to the Prophet ﷺ that says, uh, the, the sleep of the scholar is worship. 
And so it gives scholars an excuse to go to bed and say, well, I'm worshiping. Uh, you know, I mean, more seriously, what the, it, most of the theologians accept this hadith, I, I don't, but uh, they say that, well, you know, because a real scholar, even when they go to sleep, they're constantly thinking of God, and, you know, God is in their dreams, and God, so, you know, they don't really, really sleep because God is constantly in their mind. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, but it, it gives you a, a very strong sense for the building blocks, because we, I've mentioned this before. When I think of those who, in the modern age, and they think about, we want the Islamic civilization again, it is not just a matter of theoretical pontification, it is not a matter of just intelligence and intellect, but especially those who plant the seeds have to be at the height of intellectual ability and at the height of ibadah as well. It is the duality of it. It, they, they, to, or they have to feel the godly in order to demand the godly. Um, but note, قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ One of the, um, uh, one of my teachers once said, that it doesn't say explicitly that they are worship la worshiping late in the night. It says that they sleep little and they do a lot of istighfar. So um, his point was that those of you who sleep little because, for instance, in, in the context was that uh, there were the, the uh, di distributing traveling in different parts of the country to deliver food to the needy. And he said, well, that applies. If, if you are sleeping little because you're busy helping others, that applies. Um, as long as you are, and, and this is the function of istighfar, is that you are fully conscious that you're doing it for godly values. Okay. وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ Immediately, what are the, we, 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 what, what is flat to us is roles, hard work, istighfar, or either hard work or diligence and istighfar, and giving money. في أموالهم حق للسائل والمحروم. The uh, did I write who the, I know that it is a hadith from Fatima, but um, Fatima Zahra. Oh yeah, so Fatima radiallahu anha, she asked the Prophet وسلم, about this verse, um, verse uh, 19, and in their wealth, is due for, and in their wealth was a due for the beggar and the deprived. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Inna fil mali haqqan That haqq here means a right. That, and so the Prophet ﷺ explicitly says that the right of the poor in your wealth extends beyond zakah. 
Be, this is this is important, especially in, in a lot of modern Muslims think that the only part that is obligatory is the zakah. But that's dangerous to think that way. Um, before I move on. Um, One of the very interesting things I've read about Innakum Lafi Qawlun Mukhtalif. This is uh, about verse number eight. I'm, I'm just, it, it's this um, quote Fi Aqulikum al Ikhtilaf wal Iftiraq, Bain al Muslih wal Mufsid, Wal Muhsin wal Musi. وقد عرفتم الاستواء بين بينهما في هذه الدنيا فدل أن هناك دار دارا أخرى فيها يفرق بينها ويميز يفرق بينهما ويميز ويميز. Um, I didn't write down who this quote is from, but what it's saying uh, is very it's, uh, that remember it's uh, Eight, a, a literal translation is you have differing claims, and I said that you ha, you you differ amongst yourself. You have so much diversity. So this source said that that minds and intellects are so different, and there is there is the muslih and the mufsid. There is you know there's people who are good and people who are bad. And Muhsin and Musi, people who are kind and people who are unkind. So there, there are all types of intellects that have all types of orientations. But then he says that the fact that you can discern a middle path between the various blacks and whites the the fact that you can discern if you will ir, 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 reasonableness between all the diverse intellects is evidence that there has to be a hereafter and accountability and it's a it's a very interesting perspective that the fact that we can rationally think of what constitutes reasonableness, um, what constitutes an istiwa, a moderation between all the different. Um, diverse intellects is in and of itself evidence of a maker and evidence of that there is consequences and accountability in the hereafter. It's like saying uh, the very fact that you can reason through a path of moderation is evidence that there is an intentionality behind creation and ultimate accountability. It's a very unusual perspective um, that I that you don't encounter that often. So, if uh, if you guys figure and find out where this quote is from, let me know. I. I Unfortunately, I didn't write it down. And in the short period I had to try to look for it, I couldn't find it. So Then we get here to Surah Al-Dhariyat moves to tell us about a number or to mention a number of prophetic stories. And we know that we have Ibrahim and Musa 
and Samud and Nuh. And you notice what is very interesting here is that also Nuh as a prophet comes before Ibrahim in chronology. Nuh is mentioned in Surah Al-Thariyat after Ibrahim. The other thing is that grabs your attention is to ask we, we've said before that every time we are told the, the, the prophet, these prophets are mentioned because they're mentioned repeatedly in so many sore, you have to understand the mention in the context and in, in light of the objective of the surah. So that begs the question, what's different this time? in Surah al dhariyat than all the other times that Ibrahim, Musa, and Thamud, and Nuh are mentioned. So keep this in mind. And we start out with Ibrahim Oh, before that, note that in um, 21, Allah says, don't you look, أنفسكم, don't you look at yourself by reflecting upon yourself, you will see the divine. وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُرْعَ وَمَا تُعَدُونَ You study Quran translated and in the heavens is your provision and that which you were promised. Okay. Um, فَوَرَبِّ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِنَّهُ لَحَقٌ مِثْلَ مَا أَنَّكُمْ تَنْتُقُونَ This is the truth and the um, the the study of Quran, yeah, says with, uh, as that is as it is that you are endowed with speech. مثل ما أنكم تنتقون. This is the truth, as you have been given the power of speech. Now, of course, it, it's, it's a very interesting um, uh, um, why the power of speech in particular. So just keep that in mind, the power of speech in particular. Okay, so now what does it tell us about Ibrahim? هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ ضَيْفِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ الْمُكْرَمِينَ إِذْ دَخَلُوا عَلَيْهِ فَقَالُوا سَلَامًا قَالَ سَلَامٌ قَوْمٌ مُنْكَرُونَ فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ فَقَرَّبُوا إِلَيْهِمْ قَالَ لَا تَأْكُلُونَ فَأَوْجَسَ مِنْهُمْ خِيفَةً قَالُوا لَا تَخَفْ وَبَشَّرُوهُ بِغُلَامٍ عَلِيمٍ So this is now uh, which twenty the guests of Ibrahim is twenty four. So Ibrahim receives is visited by guests, honored guests, as the Quran describes it, and. There's the greeting of peace, and the, these are strangers to Ibrahim. He hasn't seen them before. And Ibrahim, as the practice of polite, um, uh, polite hosts, 
is to be generous towards guests without a fanfare. So he basically sneaks uh, sneaks uh, uh, off to his family and says, "Prepare a a prepare a uh, a big meal for these guests." And the big meal is a fattened calf, which means a big sacrifice and means that Ibrahim is is very generous. And after his family uh, cooks this calf and presents it to the guests, um, he notices that they're not eating. And the customs for in in the near east for a long time is that if you wanted if you had guests and you wanted to make yourself safe you have the guests share food with you because once they share food with you they can't hurt you it, it was the it, it was considered extremely disgraceful to partake in someone's food and then to uh, do anything that's hostile or hurtful towards them. So when he notices that they're not eating, of course, what comes to his mind is that maybe they have hostile intentions uh, towards me and towards my family. And they notice that he has become alarmed and concerned so they say to him don't be afraid don't be scared um we are here to and this is now 28 we are here to give you good news about Ghulam Alim, about Ghulam Alim is a, a, a knowledgeable child, and this knowledgeable child is Ishaq. We know it's Ishaq because elsewhere is in the Quran it says that the news delivered to him is Ishaq. Of course, the the miracle is that Ibrahim is old and his wife is old. And his wife hears what they tell him and she is surprised. And so this is now 29. Is it 29? Um, and so she she um, uh, means she she came loudly whatever the 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 I mean it's probably an expression of that she was surprised saying something like you know what are you talking about that that would be I, I don't think she was loud cry and as, as it's often translated but rather that she was surprised because she herself is well beyond the age of having uh, children. And, but she, uh, um, when it says that, uh, that she covered her face, um, she struck her face and said, a barren old woman, no, she didn't strike her, strike her face. She covered her face. It's a sign of uh, when you're embarrassed, or uh, which is again, until the the Near East became Westernized, that was a very common expression that you would see all the time. Is that um, men and and women would men if they're if they're eating something, they would put their hand in front of their mouth. Women often, if they're surprised or bashful or or embarrassed, they would put their hand in front of their mouth. Anyway, so 
she this this expression of surprise and says you know like, well, how, how could i have children and they say well this is uh what your know, god wants so the first thing is that they're delivering news of Ghulam Ali, a knowledgeable child. The second is that they tell him that they came because they are on their way to the people of Lot. The Lot is a prophet at the same time as Ibrahim and they are on their way to the people of Lot, as we know, because it's going to call for, it's going to be the end of the people of Lot. And the people of Lot will be stoned 33 and 34, it says, there will be stones of clay, masumatan inda rabbika lil musrifin. Now, often this is translated as well, marked by your Lord, lil musrifin, to those people of excess. Marked, it's like saying, uh, it could mean that the stones are going to be, you know, like targeted missiles. They're, 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 they, they've, they're intended to. In some of the traditions that are definitely not authentic, it said something, you know, you read some very strange things like, each stone had the name of the person it was supposed to kill written on it and stuff like that. But we don't, I mean, th this is all from the tradition of the Qusas, so we, we don't need to pause at, at this material. Okay. And we also are told that There was only one Muslim home, and the Muslim the, the the home is described as a Muslim home because it is a home of believers. But who comes out? فَأَخْرَجْنَا مَنْ كَانَ فِيهَا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ. This is thirty-five. Is it thirty-five or twenty-five? Thirty-five. Oh, uh, okay. So we brought forth those among them who were who were believers. Okay. So yeah. So we brought out those who were mu'minin. The reason I'm flagging this is because in the traditional tafsir you find, uh, you know, they they often talk about why did it say a Muslim home, but the people who were saved were the believers and mu'minin, not and muslimin. I don't think it's as puzzling as some people think because it's a mus it's a single Muslim home, meaning a single Muslim habitat. And that's the home of Lut. But we know that Lut, his wife, was not a believer. And we know that there were individuals who belonged to non-Muslim homes who were followers of Lut. So, فَأَخْرَجْنَا فِيهَا to bring out the, the believers, meaning to save the believers, and mu'minin, it is actually an exact expression. Because although there was one Muslim home, those who were saved were the actual people who were actually believers. Not you not designated as a Muslim home. Um, okay. 
So, and from there, the surah moves on to the Pharaoh. With the Pharaoh, we are, it's, it's fairly brief. that the the prophet is called Sahar Majnun is called a a um a sorcerer and insane but we are told this is 40 and so we um yeah, we seized him and his hosts and we cast them into the sea for he was blameworthy or he deserved the punishment. And with Ad, with the people of Ad, Arsanna alayhum al arrih al aqim. Now, Notice hey, here 41 that with Ad we sent upon them Rih Aqim, barren wind. There is the same word is used to refer to the wife of the Prophet Ibrahim, where she said, Fasakat wajha wa qalat ajuzun aqim. She describes herself as barren woman, but yet she's told she's going to have Isaac. And the people of Thamud, we are told, are going to be destroyed by a barren wind. Rihman Aqim. Okay. And, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Ad, not Samud. Um, then, with Samud, these Samud are the people who are just going to be destroyed with the Sa'aqa, right? So, they, with Samud, they are told, go ahead, enjoy yourself for three days. This is 43. And in Thamud, we, when we said unto them, enjoy yourselves for a time. And then they were that the, the thunderbolt, often translated as thunderbolt, seized them or destroyed them. Now, what, what's interesting about the is that they were so arrogant and so confident about themselves that even after their promised destruction and they're told, go ahead, enjoy themselves, they continued to party it up. They continued to have fun till the very last moment. Okay. Then we... It, it, it closes with وَقَوْمُ نُوح and it says وَقَوْمُ نُوحٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ that before all of these people were the people of Nuh إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمًا فَاسِقِينَ but it doesn't tell us anything about here in, in this surah it doesn't tell us how the people of Nuh were destroyed it just says that they were corrupt people and they were destroyed. So let's go back and so with the people of Ibrahim we have the message of Ghulam Alim and we have the woman the the mother describing herself as Ajuz Aqim, as a barren old woman. And we have 
this segues into the fate of the people of Lot who would be destroyed by stones. And from that, it moves on to the story of Moses, those who will be drowned in Eliam. And the people of Thamud that are destroyed by, uh, no, sorry, uh, people of Ad that are destroyed by Rih al the the stale wind. And the people of Thamud who are destroyed by the Saqa. And the people of Nuh who are destroyed, but we're not told in this surah how. Now, what's fascinating, I mean, of course, in the traditional tafsir, they just say that, again, that these are narratives to tell the Prophet about the fate of uh, past nations who have didn't do the, in the decent the traditional tafsir. In the Sufiyas tafsir, um, um, the the most interesting allegorical reading I recall from the Sufi Ask Tafasir is the the idea of the angels telling Ibrahim salam, that, that he will have a child after his wife and him both have become old and become infertile is they the the most interesting thing is that reading this as an allegory to the possibility or the 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 message of divinity um being possible even after one has become all hope is lost in other words, when, when all venues are closed down, um, that in in a in a word, that the true pursuers of the past would never despair, because there is no such thing in the past as uh, it being too late or it has it, God's miracle can reach anyone at any time. But other than that, this, this tidbit, um, now what, what's interesting though is that that why is the child that Ibrahim is promised described as Ghulam Alim, as a knowledgeable child? And what does this child represent at this point in the mission, the journey? and to Muslims at the time. Ilm, often in the Quran, well, ch children coupled with ilm, ilm is always coupled with hikmah, wisdom. And Ilm and children is the promise of hope and a future generation. And I've always wondered and I've paused at this so many times. For Ibrahim, the continuation of his legacy, the continuation of the message, 
is represented but not just by any child but by a knowledgeable child it is as if why did the prophet والسلام, in the battle of Uhud when he had captives of war and he said you want to earn your freedom teach a Muslim to read and write and you get your freedom that emphasis on education as opening a door to future hope an emphasis on knowledge this is this was not missed by by the ghulam uh, alim not any child that a child that represents knowledge probity understanding so now people of lot are people of incredible violence and they are in turn which is typical of old near eastern customs and practices that those who commit highly immoral acts are the, the 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 way that you condemn their immorality is to stone them which we've encountered this idea before is that the destruction is in a part of the sin itself their violence their undoing their punishment is of the same nature as their violence itself the arrogance of the people of the pharaoh the source of their bragging and their wealth as we've encountered before pharaoh bragging about the rivers that flow all around them and they're drowned and the people of ad now the people of ad what distinguishes them is they were people of luxury and built their homes or built their enclaves into the mountains and themselves and um, saw themselves as above nature of have, having mastered nature but I've always been struck by that expression wind here is is a I, I, a still wind, that wind that doesn't do any good. We elsewhere the Quran describes this destruction as a wind that pla- and that literally uh, uh, uproots them as a strong wind. But here the wind is described as a stale wind. And why the description of a stale wind here? Hold on to the thought. So why in this occasion the wind is described as stale rather than a powerful wind or destructive wind as elsewhere when it comes to the people of Had. And people of Thamud as elsewhere in the Quran it describes their destruction as through a sa'aqa. And we know that the that people of Thamud um, Uh, their uh, 
I, 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 to put it bluntly, they were gambling people in the sense that they pushed the limits of fate and dared it, dared life to destroy them. And indeed it did. And then it tells, so why does it start with Ibrahim? Because Ibrahim is the core where the story of Tawheed begins. It mentions Nuh at the end because Nuh comes before Ibrahim, but the and, and, uh, Islam, as the Quran tells us, that Ibrahim is the one who called us Muslims or called all the believers Muslims. So Islam begins with Ibrahim. Although Tawheed doesn't begin with Ibrahim, but Islam begins with Ibrahim. And the hope of the future, the next, the hope for the for growth is in knowledgeable generation. And the hope for overcoming Okm, for overcoming stillness, atrophy, death, is you need the divine grace, you need the divine miracle, and you need the ilm. You need knowledge, wisdom. So, while it is not a coincidence that with the people, with, with, when it comes to Ibrahim, it doesn't talk about destruction. Like the people of Muhammad, they're not going to be destroyed. But it sends a clear message to Muslims about the generations of the future. Ghulam Alim. And, and that it is the Ghulam Alim that, that in all the, 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 the children raised in in awareness or in knowledge or in learning. But as to the fate of past nations, it is always their excess that is the instrument and the tool of their destruction. I've always understood this as, as if telling Muslims It is, of course, echoed when the Prophet ﷺ says, you know, I don't fear, I don't fear an external er enemy for you. What I fear is that the world would open up for you and that you would live in luxury and that this luxury would spell out your destruction. In other words, that it is as if the Quran is warning Muslims, keep in mind that what you... What you see, what you plant, is what you will sow, and that it is your the nature of your sin that will ultimately be in due time your doom. And then. Right after Noah, Surat al Dhariyat then moves to this remarkable expression, وَاسْتَمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا وَبِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ We've built the atmosphere, the heavens. وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ And we will continue to expand it. Now, of course, again, in modern age, 
it, it, this is remarkable when we realize that, in fact, the, 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 the world we live in, space, is constantly expanding. In the traditional tafsir, they didn't understand, they, 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 saw, they, they thought that when Allah is saying, that well, maybe Allah is talking about that um, at the to- and in the hereafter, when when it, it time time comes for the end of everything, that Allah will expand the heavens to accommodate, uh, or Allah will expand the atmosphere to accommodate heaven. Um, it, it, some said, "Well, we don't know." A lot of them actually said, "We don't know what it means." Uh, some said, well, it just means that Allah is saying, that Allah will create things that you don't know about now, that maybe Allah will create future planets, maybe Allah will create future stars. Um, uh, Allah is just say, it's telling you that it's possible. But, of course, in our age, it's a remarkable expression. Um وَالْأَرْضَ فَرَشْنَاهَا فَنِعْمَ الْمَاهِدُونَ This is 48. And we laid out the earth perfectly. وَمِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ And of everything we've created, things in dualities. Remember again that خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنَ does it mean that we've created things in twos? It means we created dualities. So, typical um, So, he, here is an example from one of the tafsir. It says, dualities like al hissu wal ma'na, meaning and Sensation and meaning. Al hikmah wa qudra, ability and wisdom, or ability and meaning. Al sharia wa al haqiqa, law and the truth of things. Al mul al mulk wa al malakut, the material world and the malakut. Al ashbah wa al arwah, al that wa al sifat. Um, and so on. So, I mean, the the examples of dualities abund, are, are abundant in the books of uh, the, uh, the the books of the tradition, where it, it, the you know you even the the duality of right and wrong, good and bad, dark and night, and so on. فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ So فِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ 50 Uh, so flee unto God, truly I am a clear warning unto you from him. Yeah, flee unto God is, is, is accurate, but فَفِرُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ It's like saying, um, run towards God. It's like saying, and it, it in after having taken you on this sh- um, taken you on a narrative or a reminder of past prophets and saying listen so many past people, time and again, are destroyed by 
their sins. So many people are oblivious, allow for the diversity amongst them to be a reason for confusion. And out of this confusion arises sins that ultimately doom societies. And if you are smart, you would know that this is all under the careful control of its maker. So rush to God Shelter yourself in God, for I am a messenger from God, a warner from God to you. This will, as I wrap this up in the end, this will become of particular importance. So just hold on to this idea. Okay. When we go back to before, before we leave uh, uh, verse 50 um, forty-seven yeah, we've we expanding the heavens and we've laid out the earth and al-mahd is or tamheed derived from the word the same word is to prepare something so that it can bear something else. For al Mahidun means that we we've laid out the earth so that it can bear the life that it will support. From everything we've created the partnership, the dualities so run to Allah someone like Ibn Ajiba and I think it's Ibn Ajiba that says this in the context of commenting on the Dariyat and I, if, I, I think he was com commenting on I'm not sure which verse in particular but somewhere there he notes that that Surat al Zariyat points or alerts your attention to the fact that Ard al Tayyiba Tumbut al Tayyib, that good, healthy land, good soil will support a healthy growth. And so will a pure heart and a healthy heart. If you come with the seed of Islam and you plant that seed in a clean heart, in a qalb tayyib, as opposed to qalb khabith. What grows is something beautiful and pure. But if you plant it in an impure heart or a bad heart, either nothing will grow or what will grow is something foul like weeds or whatever. The reason I point this out is that passages like this in the tradition, and I've read several passages like this from different commentators, is what clearly the impact of Surat al Dariyat was and, and, and I'll talk more about the, the traditional impact of it, but that it 
whether you're talking about a traditional tafsir or a Sufi-esque tafsir, it made people think of what are we investing in? What will growth, what will grow? And this was instrumental in thinking, in, in, in developing the, the conviction that Surat al Zariyat, in fact, is doing precisely that in getting Muslims to think about the future growth of what they are about to build. So, when it talks, for instance, about وَالْأَرْضَ فَرَشْنَاهَا فَنِعْمَ الْمَاهِدُونَ We've laid out the earth and we've prepared it to sustain life. We've prepared it for the growth that you are. But then refers to the heavens and says, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ But the heavens we've built and we will expand. what you start feeling seeping into you as you worship on this is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepped the earth for our healthy growth to sustain our life and if that healthy growth means a continuing expansion in the, in the heavens, the heavens here would be an expansion of our knowledge, an expansion of our dreams, an expansion of our aspirations, an expansion of our ambition. It would make perfect sense that you don't build just willy-nilly. It would make perfect sense that if we want to build something, then we must have a tamheed. We must have a laying of fertile ground and fertile soil to enable things to grow. And we must have the ability to continue thinking about growth. It, in, in the same way that Allah alerts us to the future of things being this, to, to overcome, overcome uqm, to overcome um, uh, uh, stillness to overcome what's Ockham in English? Um, barren, barrenness. Desolate, barren. B barrenness, barrenness. To overcome barrenness, you lay the ground, you invest in a future of people with learning and wisdom and you expand the sky if you will okay and all of that requires if it are illallah that we we understand that at least those of us that understand this formula, that they must not um, allow, not to believe that they are simply in a static relationship with Allah, but to actually actively, energetically rush to the side of Allah 
فَثِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ It literally as if you are running to God and you are actively, energetically maintaining the divine in your life. Now, Sufis usually say about فَثِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ فَثِرُّوا مِنَ الْأَشْكَالِ وَالْأَضَّادِ إِلَى الْوَاحِدِ الْفَرْدِ That this is, you find this in, in so many Sufi texts, that you, you, you run away from the illusion of real forms to the truth of the one and only. And I, and you know, I understand that. But what Muslims at that time receiving Surah Al Dariyat were not being invited to a Sufi journey. They were being invited to build a civilization. And when when people who are being invited to build a civilization are taught فَثِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ that means at least the core group the, 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 the ones who are going to play the role like الغلام العليم the, the knowledgeable generation the hope must adhere to the side of Allah literally hold on to to al-i'tisam bihablillah to hold on to the rope of God with all their might so then the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is told again that don't be bothered by the fact that they are calling you, that they call you a saucer and they calling you they call you insane this is what they always do fatawalla anhum fama anta bimalum turn away from them wa dhakkir fa inna dhikra tanfa' al-mu'minin and remind فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ فَمَا أَنْتَ بِمَلُومٌ Turn away from them. You are not... It, it, it is not upon you. You're, it's again consistent with the numerous times that the Prophet is told that Remind because you don't control them. You have no authority over them. This is told to the Prophet والسلام, mere months before the Hijrah and before Muslims are using force to defend themselves. I don't think that this is a coincidence because it that never changes you will defend yourself using force but the morality the ethic of building your society remains the same and this is precisely why the prophet never took action against the so-called hypocrites the munafiqeen who are the opposition party that as long as they were not using force against Muslims, there's very little that you can do towards them. Okay. And then at this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبِدُونَ وَمَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ رِزْقًا رِزْقًا وَمَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقًا وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَن يُطْعِمُونَ I've only created, I've created jinn and ants لِيَعْبُدُونَ So now we go back to the meaning of يَعْبُدُونَ If later revelation 
didn't emphasize Ta'mir al-Ard, civilizing the earth, and didn't emphasize al-istikhlaf al-Ard, inheriting the earth, and representing godliness on earth, I think we would have a much harder time with understanding what Ya'budun means. We created humans and jinn. Li'abudun, well, submission to Allah is already a fact. In the sense, we live within the laws of God. Our ability to rebel against Allah is already a fact. The prohibition against compulsion and coercion فذكر ما أنت إلا مبذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر. You don't control them. You only can you can only invite them, but you don't control them. It's already a fact. So what does I've created people and jinn ليعبدون mean? Well, we already said that if the objective was pure ibadah. Meaning, supplication, the angels do that. Those that don't have free will or free choice do that. Moreover, we know that there are all types of humans that are created that are not capable of ibadah. And this is something, by the way, that, that, that troubled theologians for, they wrote a lot about it. People who are created insane, or children who die before adulthood, or people who are created and they never get a hint of the Islamic message or for any matter, or for that matter, any other religious message. So, it is not the rituals in the form of the legalistic sense, although these are mandatory, but that's not the meaning of I've created humans and jinn إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ To internalize or to reflect in a true self the truth of divinity in the earth that they inherit or whatever they inherit the godly values of sifat al-ilahiyya at-takhalluq bi khulq Allah if i put it this way if i inherit a plot of land and in that plot of land i do one thing is that I bring my family and I force my family to pray night and day. I force them to pray night and day. Can anyone seriously say that I'm fulfilling Allah's purpose? In وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I think every rational person would say, you know, no, the, the, the fact that you're forcing them to pray night and day defeats everything. Take an alternative. I bring a plot of land, and in my family, I don't force them to do anything. But what I do is that I constantly talk to them about how God 
we should be grateful to God. This is a gift from God. This land truly belongs to God. And that they should be grateful and worship God. And would then have someone say, I've discharged my obligation towards God. And the answer would be yes. I, I've, I've discharged my obligation in understanding the objective. So now let's go back and wrap the, the whole surah. We can't simply chop up the surah. The surah starts out by Allah swearing by, if you will, energies or movements or functions. And the functions, when we think about what Allah is underscoring for us, those that distribute or those that so I don't forget anything yeah those that generate and spread a concept an idea a value an objective a maqsad an ethic whatever it is those that carry it nurture it grow it those that communicate it and transmit it allow it to circulate and spread and ultimately those that break down the various functions from muqassimati amra that break down the various functions and the various roles that are necessary for the growth of a thing. All of these are critical constituent elements in al wad al-Sadiq, in the true promise, and the fulfillment of the truth of the promise. Understand that yes, there is a lot of diversity, a lot of, and that there are people who are confused by this diversity and who can't see the path clear because of this diversity. The worst threat are the frauds, the manipulators, the connivers, the deceivers. There is a promise of a future like the promise of the Prophet Ibrahim, the father of the prophets who sustained the entire legacy of Islam until the Prophet Muhammad But the heart of that promise was Ghulam Alim that overcame the stillness and the barrenness of what the world reached by the time the Prophet Ibrahim came along. At the time the Prophet Ibrahim came along, it was said that, they didn't, that Ibrahim was the only muwahid on the face of the earth, the only monotheist on the face of the earth. What overcame that? It, a child anchored in knowledge and wisdom. But be careful because so many people 
after the Prophet Ibrahim went astray and were destroyed by the nature of their own sins. Lay the groundwork for the future. And think of growth, of expansion. These are necessary steps for fulfilling what Allah has put you on this earth to do. Ibadatullah. To uphold the godly, the divine on this earth. And notice 59 as the Surah Dhariya closes. فَإِنَّ لِلَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا ذُنُوبًا مِثْلَ ذُنُوبِ أَصْحَابِهِمْ فَلَا يَسْتَعْجِلُونَ For those who have lived in iniquity and injustice, including the injustice of kufr, because as we said, kufr is injustice. Ingratitude in God is injustice, for God is injustice. Their sins accumulate one above the other as they lead one another astray. Those who do wrong are sins like unto the sins of their companions. So let them not seek to hasten. Their sins will catch up with, with them in due time. Precisely the stories that are being conveyed to you by, through the, the narratives of the prophets and the punishments. Sin accumulates sin, causes sin. They build upon one another. You think you're getting away with it for a while, but then it catches up with you and does you in. One final, last, scary thought is that if you read it there yet and you think of our faith of, as Muslims, Allah says, فَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ go, go look, walk in the earth and study the fate of past nations and you will see the truth of what I told you. For modern Muslims, It, what, what destroyed El Andalus are the injustices that plagued El Andalus. The, the arrogance, the despotism, the numerous, injusti the numerous injustices that, that uh, why? Because injustice breeds treason. It is because there was so much injustice in Andalus. So many Muslims became traitors to their own people and sold their own people out until Andalus fell. Injustice creates hypocrites and traitors. That's the truth. What tore down the Islamic Khilafah was treason by so many Muslims against their own people. And what time and time again what breeds this treason is despotism and injustice. When people feel like their whole value system has crumbled because they suffer injustice, they become like poison against their own people. 
if we study our own history, we will see the truth of what Allah was telling us all along. Um, by the way, it's the same thing that tore down the Soviet Union. Um, it's not any different. Okay, alhamdulillah. That's the Surah al Oh, I forgot anything. I don't think so. What's the dhikr? Um... It is. Oh my God! Look, it's just now. But this is an unusual dhikr because normally the dhikr is an actual supplication. But um, what number is that? Fifty-six. Oh. Um, but I. The reason I've kept reciting it all night is because I wanted to understand. I knew, I had a feeling this is this was the key to the entire surah. Um, so that's why I'm calling it the dhikr, because it was the key to the entire surah. Is that number 56? Mm -hmm. Okay, phew. Um, alhamdulillah, that's <laughs> very intense and amazing. It's 9.30. Well, we need to pray Maghrib. Yeah, okay, so we're going to pray Maghrib, and then we'll come back um, and just go ahead and send your questions through the chat, and inshallah we'll do the Q&A. And if, for those who didn't hear, it was verse 56 was the vicar. Okay. Should we get started? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Are we okay, Shri? Okay. Um, you know, you never, th like, we never think that surahs are just going to get better and better I don't that's not even the right word to use but like more um, humbling and more humbling but they always do and so um, thank you it's not even really sufficient but alhamdulillah truly alhamdulillah I feel really um, grateful for being able to, to I mean benefit from this there's just no words because it's so it's so priceless, it's so valuable, and um, it's hard to believe that um, you know we're here sitting and benefiting from it, and that you know, it's like just I don't know. <laughs> it's a, sound like an idiot, but it's just thank you. It's just so amazing. So I I don't know if we have. Um, Many uh, questions because people are speechless. Do you have one? Yeah. Okay, so we do. Um, so actually, then why don't you start us off, Rami? Um. Okay, uh, can you just set it down? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh. Well. Before Rami asks this question, I, I want to say something. Um, so, I think this is from Ibn Ajiba. So, uh, when when uh, uh, Ibrahim is told that he has uh, uh, the, the angels uh, bring them the news that he will have a child who is alim, who is knowledgeable, so Ibn Ajiba says, وَبَشَّرُوهُ بُغُلَامٍ عَلِيمٍ وَهُوَ نَتِيجَةِ الْمَعْرِفَةِ مِنَ الْيَقِينِ الْكَبِيرِ وَطُمَأْنِينَ الْعُظْمَةِ فَأَقْبَلَتِ النَّفْسُ تَصِيحِ وَتَقُولِ أَأَلِدُ هَذَا الْغُلَامِ مِنْ هَذَا الْقَلْبِ وَقَدْ قَبْرَ عَلَى ضَعْفِ الْيَقِينِ وَأَنَا عَجُوزِ شِخْتُ فِي so on so forth. So, when Ibn Ajiba comments on it, when, I mean, they read the whole story allegorically. But it, what's in, what was interesting to me is that in Sufi asked Tafasir, Tafasir like Ibn Ajiba, they, they saw the message of a knowledgeable child as an allegory for 
certitude of belief, an allegory for uh, it. And this is, this is what led me down the road to thinking, no, the, it, when, when Allah describes uh, the, the child as Ghulam Alim, this is, of course, everything in the Quran we assume is intentional. But that, but I took the meaning towards a different direction than Ibn Ajiba. Ibn Ajiba sees the, the knowledgeable child as the child of wisdom and certitude uh, for uh, a heart that has grown barren. I read it as within the historical context of a surah to Muslims at this critical stage who are about to build a civilization. And this is just for uh, people who want, you know, who, who think about, well, what, what, how does your methodology work? Um, and what, in what ways does it connect to the tradition? Does it not connect to the tradition? So, I mean, it's fair to say that the tradition is always a source of inspiration. But it is like Allah says, Allah created the heavens and Allah keeps expanding the heavens. And so I see, I understand the tradition as it precisely that. It's like the, 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 the nuts and bolts on there, but it is up to us to keep expanding it and taking it to directions and heights and new understandings. Um, but I claim that the way that I read Surah al dhariyat is the way that it was understood to the early generation. I, I think that there, there, there was a civilizational imperative in the early generation. And there are so many indicators as to how these people got their civilizational imperative. Um, and we ignore it at our own peril. Okay, Rami, ask your question. Um, uh, <laughs> it's actually not a question, but it's uh, following on the same exact thing that you're talking about, just because, I mean, I was just discussing with uh, Joe that uh, your understanding of uh, that it's not just ritual, you know, praying and supplication is, you know, consistent with, with previous interpretations. Mm -hmm. So I do see your take as kind of like an extension of building on... Yeah. But I also wanted to share, I mean, the, I, I only bring it up now just so that we can get it on the record and include it yeah. potentially in the tafsir. Um, so when Ibn Ajib is commenting on when he talks about, he quotes al uh, Tashbi says, Jafar al-Sadiq says, وَمَا خَلَقْتَ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ أَيْ لِيَعْرِفُونِ um, and then the hadith of Kuntu Kanzan Makhfiyan. Hidden treasure. Yes. And uh, which connects back to 21. Uh, mm -hmm. Where they frequently talk about the idea of Man Arifa Nafsa, Arifa Radla. And the reason why I sort of see this connection is because he quotes uh, Al Qushayri as saying, "Yushir ila anna nafs mar'at jami'a sifat al haq, etc., etc." And then, yeah, "Fayarif nafsahu bil mar'atiya akafa." فلا يعرف أحد نفسه إلا بعد كمالها وكمالها أن تصير مرآة كاملة تامة مسقولة قابلة لتجلي صفات الحق لها فيعرف نفسه بالمرآتية وعن يعرف ربه بالتجلي فيها which I mean 
this connection is just saying, I mean, like yeah, exactly what we're talking about, like al takhluq bi khulqillah, and that's what really ibadah means in that sense. Um, I don't feel very yeah, translated that. Or. But I mean, I can par- paraphrase it. But I'm actually, I mean, uh, really happy to Jafar al Sadiq. Um, in uh, Ibn Ajiba quotes the, the Jafar al Sadiq has a famous statement that when he is asked about what the uh, the Abidun uh, means, and Jafar al Sadiq says uh, to to know to come to know Allah. But what Rami's the 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 parts of Ibn Ajiba that he read is that Ibn Ajiba says, well, to to come to know Allah. You, you need to know yourself. But to know Allah through the self, you, you, the self itself has to achieve its potential or its truth and to, 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 to achieve its, its, its perfection. And to do that, it realizes within itself the attributes of divinity so it's like the when you come to the point of understanding the attributes of divinity within the self then the self becomes a path to god and it, this is of course it, it it shows i mean the, the when when i said that uh, to Allah says humans and jinn to, to worship and uh, worshipping is to reflect the values of divinity to reflect the, 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 the characteristics of divinity um, it, the, the link with what Ibn Ajiba says is clear that but Ibn, Aj, Ibn Ajiba like a lot of the Sufi tradition sees that to achieve the the values of divinity within the self as that's the ibadah in many ways what, what I'm seeing is that it is at a social level it's, it's reflecting the values of godliness at a social level and of course, but understanding the way that I understand Khartul Isa or Jinnli Abudun is not unusual. It, it's um, uh, m- many have understood it as not just ritual, but it is fulfilling divinity. Um, I, so yeah, but I'm, I'm happy that you, you brought that, this up because it, it shows like the genesis of ideas and, and how they develop. And, um, but it, it, it's, um, I mean, it, it's, in it, it, that yet, it, the, the more you, Although it's a short surah, but it is, it's one of these surahs that the more you study it, the more you reflect on it, the more you realize it's as if alerting you to the truth of the universe in just a few short, in 60 hours. It's like, it's like telling you, it's warning you about everything and it's telling you everything in short 60 hours. Just 60 hours. But it is, it's one of these surahs that it, the, the more you internalize, the more it speaks to you in ways that you can't even describe. I wanted to ask a question building on, on that. <clears throat> so like in, in this Sora, we learn about how people have functions and roles 
and that everyone should, I mean, as part of understanding their self, understand perhaps, you know, what their role is, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Right. That's like at a functional level. Um, and then we also know more in a, in a global, like when you say, you know, develop the divinity in yourself, do different people have different like potentialities for different aspects of divinity or does everyone have sort of an equal um, ability to access like the attributes of divinity and then like how does that no it, it, it's I mean there is no in the same way that no two fingerprints are the same, no DNA, DNA codes are the same, no, no set of potentialities are the same within a human being. And I think it's, it's uh, um, I mean, I, I don't know how a Sufi would, would respond to this, but I've never, as much as um, in the Sufi tradition, they always have, they always talk as if there isn't like a, a, an absolute, an objective perfection that you reach. But there are no two Sufi masters that are the same. At least in, in my experience, whether in, in the written legacy or in their practice life, um, you always find um, those who are able to, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just thought of Sufis because they're the ones that tend to think of like an objective standard the most. Um, but it is, and, and this is part of when we pretend that there is like a, a, a uniform standard for all. That's what leads to pietistic affectations because it's like as if you you are imposing a superficial uh, dress code on everyone, and everyone tries to perform that dress code to tick off the the insignia of of piety. And uh, the remark, and and we read on. Unfortunately, we often read the seerah this way. I mean. We forget the values. What what is consistent within the values of the Sira is that you you find the the early Muslims were remarkably willing to understand and to perform the realization of the importance of roles. So, you know, when there were the people who carried the standard in the battle. And there, there, but there were also the translators, there were the scouts, there were the merchants, there were, I mean, there were so many different functions. And the, the, the tradition surprises you by how accepting they were towards the diversity of roles. You don't have too many situations, at least in the recorded tradition, that where people are, you know, uh, 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 but they were all very different human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they 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 were when you when you get start studying the the nothing ever took away their individuality. Sometimes, even when you read traditions, you get to the point where you can sort of predict, you could say, oh, this sounds like um, Ibn Omar, or this is, sounds like Ibn Mas'ud. This is something that Ibn Abbas would say. Uh, and, and this is an, even the later generation, among, among that generation, leave alone the generations like Omar al-Khattab and Abu Bakr and so on. Um, and that's what I think was part of the genius of the Prophet is that is that he never turned them into monotones. They, they never became replicas of one, on, of one another. Um, and that's part of the, the, the genius of leadership. 
uh, that I, I wish we would discover in, in uh, you know, um, yeah. But I guess it's also like part of your test if you have a propensity towards jealousy or propensity towards miserliness or something like that. I mean, that that's 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 what I the big the I mean what makes so many social movements fail is that people start when when everyone wants to play when there's a vast uh, uh, inequality in the distribution of roles so you know if everyone wants to become a doctor it will fail if everyone wants to become an engineer it will fail if everyone wants to become a scholar the faqih it will fail it, it it's a sign of an imbalanced society mm -hmm. you know if if the way society is organized is that the only way you can feel respected and valued is to be a doctor. But if you're not, then you feel inferior. That's a sign that cannot be a godly society. Mm -hmm. That's a society that has failed. What is brilliant about just societies is that you find each person in their guild and I'm talking like history now. Each person in the guild, fulfilled and proud mm -hmm. of what they do. They see the role as important, as critical, as full of art, full of genius, and they're very proud of it. And they feel equally valued. And when societies lose that, everyone is Khalid ibn al-Walid, or everyone is a Salah al-Din, or, you know, uh, everyone is a medical doctor. And these are the societies that crash. Uh, and that has, I mean, I, I've, it, it took, I, I've, th and this is another conversation, but st one of the, my obsessions was studying the Sira and, and is was trying to understand why is it that I grew up in a society where, where every person I knew either was a complete loser in life or everyone wanted to be a great leader. No one wanted to be the lead. While when I would read the Sira, I wouldn't get that. Mm -hmm. I don't get that. I, and I wanted to understand why. But that's another another conversation and another inquiry in the Sira. Okay, inshallah, to be continued. Does anyone else have any questions? Mm -hmm. I just have a quick follow-up for that question. And I don't know if it's answerable, but do you ever think it's too late or too early to understand your role and your strengths and weaknesses? And how do you progress towards that more and more? Too late, I mean, you know, of course, the practicalities of life impose limitations on us. That, that's the, that's, but, but, you know, um, I really admire, I, I don't know, I've, you know, I, I, I've, I've, um, in, I find like usually it's not Muslims who, who are doing this, but uh, you know I find someone in their in their fifties or sixties and they're going to law school, or you know someone who's doing after retirement and they're doing a doctorate in a field, and and you know every every time I, I, I encounter that for some reason I feel like I'm seeing something very Islamic. I really do. I, I just feel like, wow, you know, they that's a very, hope. yeah, it's yeah. like, it, 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 as long as you believe in Allah, there, you can't, you, there is no, you can't lose hope, because you, it, it's, at least, you know that faith is in Allah's hand, and Allah can, can, 
make anything happen. And it is your obligation to plant the seed regardless of whether you're going to see the, the, the plant grow or not. And and this is precisely what I think Surah Al-Dariyat is all about, is that there has to be those who plant the seed, there has to be those who nurture the, the, the budding, the, the growth of the initial bud. There has to be those who take care of the plant as it grows. There has to be those who make sure the plant reproduces and continues. There has to be those who then make sure that to handle the fruit of the plant. There has to be roles. And and the, the thing that strikes you about the, the, the earlier generations, I mean, uh, um, is that how remarkably resilient they are, uh, they were. I mean, um, some of these people um, who converted to Islam like in, in late in their lives, and the, the, at this point in your life, and you think that they're going to live and die in Medina, or live and die in Mecca, but you discover that late in their life they move to Kufa or move to Basra or move to Cairo or move to some, you know, went to Tajikistan or Bahur and, and they started a new life there. And that is why the, the companions of the Prophet are buried all over. Uh, they're, they're not in, primarily in Medina, or in, um, which is rather striking. It's that adventurous spirit that Islam infected them with, instilled in them. And I think that adventurous spirit comes from a deep Iman and a belief that um, it, it's all in Allah's hand and that you, you are under obligation to pursue what you feel is Allah's call to you. Um, yeah. Any more questions in here? Okay, what is the relationship, actually I was going to ask this same question too, what is the relationship of Prophet Noah and his people to the Surah and what is the inside message regarding him? Yeah, the, the Prophet uh, Noah, I mean, subhanAllah, that here the, the, the flood is not mentioned. And um, I've often thought of, okay, so pro first we start with Ibrahim and then we go through uh, Musa and Pharaoh and Ad and Thamud and then there's this brief mention of Prophet Nuh without mentioning um, the flood. Um, so, a couple of things. Was Noah mentioned because or to, it could have, would it have made sense to just omit the mention of Noah altogether? So why mention Noah at all? And what I know if is uh, how do I put this? No is a a a, the the message or the the legacy of Noah as as a Muwahid who uh, persists among his people trying according to the Quran sent for centuries and after so I mean in many ways he is the epitome of a patient prophet he tries for according to the Quran, for nine plus centuries. And after nine plus centuries, the yield of the Prophet is very small. And 
we don't know about the nature of the sins of the people of and the the of the people of Nuh alayhi salam um the Quran doesn't tell us as much as the nature of their sins or the nature of their habits other than they were remarkably obstinate and that they were cruel that they mocked him they 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 assaulted him they made fun of him um and every time Nuh is mentioned in in the Quran, I always find a reference to or a, a, a the, the conveying of the meaning of perseverance, even when it looks like the world deserves a flood to just wipe everything away. It is like um, in the case of Noah, he, he actually got the flood, but most of us are not going to live as long as the Prophet Noah li lives. Or all of us are not going to live as long as, as long as the Prophet Noah lives, but all of us are not going to have the patience to keep trying for 900 plus years. And the, the, the only thing I could, um, uh, is that the reason like Noah has mentioned at the end is to remind Muslims that sometimes um, it, you, even when you don't have the promise of the, a, a next generation, even if it doesn't look like people are go, are pay are the the sins are going to have the type of consequences that they do, even if it takes literally the perseverance of the Prophet Noah. This is. This is up to Allah. In other words, your charge is to keep plowing, to keep performing these various roles. While it is the, and that's that's what I could figure as to why the Prophet Noah is mentioned at the end in that fashion. And Allah Alam, because I mean, I, I I would suspect that other people studying this, they might come up with other things I didn't think of. Um, can you elaborate more on Ibrahim's barren wife? In which context is it never too late? Think, for example, of cancer patients or people born with disabilities. Yeah, uh, of course, his barren wife is not. It it, it took it prophetic miracle for for a, for a wife that old to have a child and it doesn't mean that people should have hope that they will have children regardless of the circumstance that's not the barrenness that that's not the uqm that the that i think is intended by the surah it, 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 that type of uqm could be overcome for prophets and perhaps can be overcome in certain circumstances by science, um, uh, you know, with Allah's permission. But the 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 I the, the you ask the question of why is Allah telling us a story about people who have reached the point of hopelessness, but. It is the promise of an ed educated future generation that injects hope in their life. To put it quite simply and bluntly, is you want hope when all hope seems to be lost, invest in the education of your future generations. Create the Ghulam Alim. 
I, I'll give you um, an example of of what's precise the, 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 um, that pharaoh that rules Egypt these days um, who is every bit as bad as the pharaohs of the old. Uh, he has a he he famously in Egypt very little of the gross national product is spent on education. Well, under that current pharaoh, he even cut the amount of money that the state puts in education even more. I think he cut it by fifty percent, which already I mean means no money is being spent on education. So he was asked about this, and he said, well, what is the point of, educa of education in a country that is ruined? His, his point is that we should spend the money on tourism, we should spend the money on, I don't know, building palaces for him and his family, not on education. Well, that's precisely what is the attitude that I think Surat is Dariyat is telling you not to have. If there's anything that will, when everything looks like it's hopeless, if there's anything that is going to be a hope for the future, is to invest in, in an educated generation. And that's the, the reference to barrenness. Um, uh, it, it's not, uh, it's remember the oath at the beginning with things that are pregnant with possibilities. Well, if you want to ask what is pregnant with possibilities, it's not um, uh, uh, it, it is not investing in military military hardware. It's not investing in villas or uh, posh buildings. It's not investing in uh, infrastructure for the rich. The thing that is pregnant with possi with possibilities is to educate a coming generation and. It's remarkable that at the beginning of the surah, Allah swears with things that are pregnant with possibilities. But in order to, to have that right attitude, you have to have a correct value system. A value system that is anchored in a, in a right morality. Because if you don't have the right morality, you're not going to think about investing in a, in, you're going to think of investing in privilege. You're going to think of investing, I want to educate the sons and daughters of rich people so they can continue being rich. I don't want to educate everyone so that then they can compete with my children when they grow up. If you don't have the right value system, you're going to think of, I want to invest in what would put my children on top of everyone else so that they can have a disproportionate amount of power and privilege not in what would make society innovative and creative and dynamic. Um, this is the, so put it differently, I agree with the Sufi allegorical reading of the story, but I read the allegories differently. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, this this halakha was <sighs> what was your adventure sentence. <laughs> this halakha was dot dot dot. I did. Dot. I sighed. Was, that was, was the heaviest <laughs> sigh ever. <laughs> It, it was amazing, it was, it was, it left me frustrated, it, I, I didn't finish the sentence for your sake, Ron. <laughs> I didn't want to bore you. Um, 
but it made me think of this this um, part in Fiqh al-Sira by Muhammad al-Ghazali um, that when, when you're talking about civilizations and I guess I, I just wanted to throw it out there and see what you would say um, the people of Mecca were weak in thought strong in desire since there is no relationship between the maturity of thought and the maturity of instinct more between the backwardness of societies from the intellectual point of view and their backwardness from the point of view of lusts and desires. The viciousness of desires and lusts which we hear about in Paris and Hollywood is not much more than what was experienced in the past centuries when corruption was spread over the surface of the globe. The advance of civilization has no effect from this point of view except to increase the means of gratification, but the desires themselves remain the same before and after the flood. Selfishness, greed, show, quarant quarreling and jealousy as well as the other despicable qualities filled the world of old though over the ages they appeared in different clothing right. and I, I feel like because I, I see a, people do contribute to educational organizations but it's usually after those educational organizations invest a lot of money in in optics and in making things appear well and they find the trending topic and then they put it in you know this is this is how you can feel more positive. This is how you know you can. This yeah. is Islam within the energy context. So it's almost like fitting Islam within a, a a a trending topic, dressing it up in something that's. But when it comes to actually like an in depth, you know, I think it, people don't realize that the Suli Institute we don't put effort into making things sexy because it's like. Our, our focus is on the content and so it's, it's it's frustrating for me because I don't I feel like a big hurdle that we have is that people don't recognize or fooled by the fact that our civilization seems so advanced that they lose sight of the fact that our civilization is totally just based on gratifying ourselves in every realm even intellectually even academia is just about gratifying mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, okay, if I need to turn it into a question, what's the way out of it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, I have to say, though, I, I'm, I mean, it is, yes, it's true, but. But at the same time, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, okay. Um, I mean, in the time that, I, okay, I, I've, I've, at, at, I'll use my school as an example. Okay. Um, when I started at UCLA, um, there was an Islamic studies program um, and the Islamic studies program is actually the oldest Islamic studies program in the country and the Islamic studies program was just had no money um, just it, it was it, it, during the time I was at UCLA, I, uh, I saw a richly endowed Armenian studies program emerge. The Armenian uh, um, families in LA got together and they, over, over the course of 20 plus years, they, they, in different stages, they, um, a Jewish studies program became richly endowed, an Israeli studies program became richly endowed, a Holocaust studies program became richly endowed. Um, during the time I was in LA, um, an Iranian studies program that is very anti-Islamic, Persian studies pre-Islam Iran, nothing to do with Muslim Iran. In fact, it's as if Iran Muslim Iran is just like 
uh, heretical. But it, 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 the, the, the Iranians that endowed that program gave it a lot of money. Um, during that time as well, um, the, the Indian Studies program grew because it grew enormously because the the rich Indian folks who have very strong Indian nationalistic ideas that are also very anti-Islamic uh, gave UCLA a lot of money to and the thing that just struck me I I'm just I I'm just I I have. I, this thing, uh, okay, uh, the Williams Institute, which is focused on uh, gay studies and the law. Um, the there was a a um, um, a woman. The the a, a family that is. Um, Turkish but not Muslim gave UCLA I don't know how many million dollars for a human rights program. Um, another another family gave UCLA I don't know how many million dollars a lot of million dollars a lot like something like 10 million dollars for a refugee law program. Now of course I, I've noticed that all of these in the refugee law is named after the family that gave the money. Uh, the human rights program is named after the family that gave the money. Uh, the Armenian, uh, yeah, recognition of the family in the sense that, you know, they, they get an invitation and the the provost or the, um, uh, the uh, uh, gifts office, you know, wines them and dines them a little bit but fundamentally it's not a lot of attention I mean what drove these people the Armenians is that they really care about their ethnicity the Iranians they hate really hate Islam and they really care about their Persian ethnicity um, the Jewish studies, the Israeli studies, the Holocaust studies, we, we know what, you know, what drives that. Um, the Williams Institute, it, it, it's again, the, the, the cause, because it's called the Williams Institute, but there are many Williams, you know, many, many last families whose last names of Williams. So it's not even that distinctive. So, there is something awfully wrong with the Muslim psyche. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I try to resist that conclusion because um, we've gone from the most generous people on the face of the earth to, I don't know. I mean, we, we give money and then what we create is bayan. Or what we create is Zaytuna. <clears throat> what? What are we like? Little like little ghetto type institutions for ghetto mentalities with ghetto values with, and so I I don't know. I mean, it seems. I mean, when I try to find the only thing I cannot come up with really is that colonialism has really broken our spirit that that we don't we don't trust each other we don't trust ideas we don't trust knowledge we don't trust scholarship we don't it's like the 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 fighting spirit of a Muslim has been broken. Um, I mean, I, I don't quite, yeah, I understand the whining and dining and the, 
the, the kissing up to rich people and you know making them feel but but I've seen people give a lot of money just because they believe in something um, but they're not Muslim and they don't get and I've seen Muslims that's the real irony I've seen Muslims give a lot of money but to not Islamic causes for very little in return like I, I've seen a Muslim family in LA go and give a medical school in Irvine 20 million dollars for what N practically nothing not the, nothing was even named after that family and it's just it's like I just don't trust fellow Muslims um, and I, I have to admit that when I meet, the first thing when I say salam alaikum to a Muslim, I feel like they look at me suspiciously. They're sizing me up. And it's like, you know, and we don't trust each other. We, we all have, and, and the only thing I can find to explain the, the, these, these deep maladies is the role of how colonized Muslim culture has become. That we 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 all distrust each other because too many times in our lives the real and unreal have been blurred through broken broken promises, broken hopes, broken dreams, um, through treason, through betrayals, through you know. Um, I mean, everything is a phase, and that phase will pass. Um, but it's just how many generations need to be destroyed and wasted before it passes. That, that's what we really have to care about. Inshallah. Well, may, may we work towards hope for the future. This, I think this surah really addresses that issue and and may may Allah send our, our way the the type of Muslim that is not defeated and broken and just says okay I believe in you guys <laughs> inshallah. okay on that note <laughs> that's a good place to end inshallah um, it was a long surah we're now like um, at 10:45. Oh wow. Yeah. So, wow. Uh, but it felt like I mean it was so engaging. So, alhamdulillah, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us for another incredible surah. Thank you everyone who stayed with us for as long as you did. Um, may Allah bless you and inshallah we look forward to seeing you on the weekend on Saturday. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum Joshua. Nice seeing you. Good to see you. Assalamu alaikum.